Good morning. Good morning. Alright. You know, I was um, I was in a cemetery the other day. I'm one of those people too, you know. Like me and Wayne, <laughs> Kilpatrick. I enjoy going to cemeteries. I'm just, I'm just gonna tell you right now, that's my confession today. And then not only that, I bring my kids with me. <laughs> okay. So um but, but uh, there's a couple cemeteries that are my favorites around here, okay? Top two, top two cemeteries in the Florence area. And I can give you a top five later. But uh, <laughs> top two is number one, the Jackson Cemetery, over by the Forks of Cypress. And uh, I wonder if you're related to these Jacksons. <laughs> I, I don't even know. But uh, uh, this is a family related to Andrew Jackson. And if you want to know the, one of the, the interesting insights is there was a, a plantation that used to be located at the forks of the Cypress River. There's two, there's two Cypress Creeks and they come together to forks and they both have different names. You know, I mean, like, I can't remember what, Little Cypress and Big Cypress or, or something like that. But anyway, they come together and so there's a plantation that was established there. Andrew Jackson used to come down and race his horses here. James Jackson built the place. And what's interesting was the house was struck by lightning on June the 6th, 1966, and the house burned down. Did you catch that? 6666, six, six, six. okay. I know it's supposed to be three, but, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, this made it a uh, cultural phenomenon that for some reason people who are interested in cultic activities associated with devil worship came to the conclusion that this was the place that we must do our mischievous deeds. And so then it gained a reputation for that type of activity uh, throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I think that the reputation may be gone by now. Uh, there was a conscientious effort to clean that up. Well, cemetery number one, Jackson Cemetery. I'm not really going to talk about uh, that the rest of the time. The second <laughs> cemetery is Coffee Cemetery. Coffee Cemetery, uh, if you, it's, it's, it's just about three miles from here three or four miles, you go down Cox Street Park Parkway, turn north on Cloverdale Road, and it's immediately to your left. If you go to the Coffee Cemetery, be careful where you park because it's behind a man's property, and he's had a lot of traffic lately, and uh, he will come out and stand on his front porch and potentially yell at you if you park in the wrong spot. So um, he didn't yell at us because I've, I've talked to him several times. But the high school teacher at Mars Hill was, is largely responsible for uncovering the cemetery and cleaning it up and, and sort of giving it the maintenance that it needs. The coffee cemetery. I love these moments in, in channel talks when you sit here and you go, now why in the world would I talk about the coffee cemetery today? Well, give me, okay. Uh, okay, I remember now. <laughs> I went out to the coffee cemetery twice over about a, uh, a one-week time period, uh, about seven or eight days in between. The first day I went with, uh, with my kids, we just walked around, had a good time. There's some monuments that go back to around the year 1825 uh, or so. One of the people buried there was raised by Andrew Jackson, and uh, so that's pretty fascinating. But the second time we went back, I was swatting gnats. I was like, what? I'm like, this is crazy. It's January. I'm swatting gnats. There was grasshoppers jumping all over the place on the ground, you know, new grasshoppers. And then there was this fungus that had grown up into a tree uh, that was about this big. And it was very fascinating. I didn't know what it was. And it had grown out of a hole in a tree. And I remember just looking at that going, this thing's not moving, but yet a week ago it wasn't here. It happened so quickly, but we couldn't see it. There's so much change going on, this is my point, there's so much change going on all around us that we oftentimes don't even notice it. In fact, uh, do, 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 uh, does anybody have a memory of something that happened to you on the way to school, even if on the way means walking from there to here? Is there something so pronounced in your memory that, that sticks out to you, anybody? I mean, this is a real question, it's not rhetorical. <laughs> Okay, well that makes the, makes the point. Um, I do have a memory uh, because one or two things happened on the way to school that stuck out, but typically I don't remember the details. The only reason I remember this morning is because my brakes in the back, I've come to the conclusion, need to be changed because I'm hearing metal on metal. And so normally I don't remember things, but, <laughs> but today it was an excruciating experience the whole way here. You see what I'm saying? 
So, but typically, we just don't recall the events that take place. And so, what what that means is, is we don't really we don't have good reference points on how to chart progress and change in our life. And the only way that this usually happens for us, physically speaking, is to look at photographs. Look at photographs. Uh, I pulled out some photographs from about uh, 12 years ago, and you know I had that whoa, you know, type moment. And so I realized, oh, some things have changed, you know, just physically. But well, what's changed up here? What's changed personally? What's changed spiritually? Think about the friends that you had a few years ago, a year ago. Think about the friends you have now. Think about the associates that you uh, work with, talk with, spend time with. Think about the interests that you have right now. Are you actually keeping up with how you're changing? Uh, you know, I know I have a friend that I talk to. He's been we've been friends since high school, and we talk to each other about every week or two. And it's always a real good reference point for me, just sort of plotting things out. Because when he starts to go in a new direction and I'm not going that way, I usually hammer him. I mean, not like in a mean way, but. And it's the same with me. It goes back and forth. You know, we, we can sort of see the way we're developing and changing because he's in such a different context. He's been influenced by things that don't influence me at all, and vice versa. And so we can sort of get an idea of what's happening that way. Well, this concept of uh, plotting out your change and your progress is actually one that's in Scripture. The topic today is learning how to do a personal assessment and inventory. I think it's a pretty important concept. Uh, in the Bible to learn to monitor uh, yourself and your own change and sort of see how you're growing. If you, if, now, I want you to think about this for just a minute. If you're the kind of person who has different eras of your life and the eras don't communicate with each other, you really need to be aware of that. <clears throat> what, what, what are you talking about, Jeremy? If you had to completely turn your back on an era of your life to go to somewhere else, you need to take note that you've done that because there's a whole series of reference points in your life that you now have cut yourself off of from. Now, you may be thinking it was for the better. Maybe you had a bad life, and now this is a good life. But how are you keeping up with who you are in your relationship to Christ? Now, there are some, there are some parameters that are set out in Scripture that will help us to do this. Uh, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13. In chapter 13, this comes at the end of a section, uh, chapters 10 to 13, that are oftentimes called the sorrowful letter. Uh, I remember I had to write a paper when I was in school, an introduction to, to uh, the New Testament, on whether or not chapters 10 to 13 were a separate letter. And the reason that people have talked about these four chapters as possibly being a separate letter is because Paul's rhetoric so drastically changes and gets intense that people have thought, does this have anything to do with the first nine chapters? I mean, he's just railing on them, pounding this, uh, his opponents uh, that he had in Corinth, trying to make his point. And finally, when you get to the end of chapter uh, 13, what you realize is that he's not just pounding his opponents, but he's wanting the church in Corinth to see him basically go to rhetorical war with his opponents so that they will decide who they're with. I mean, Paul's landed on the line here. This is one of those type of letters here in, in, in these chapters where you know this is a potential make or break. And what's so up in the air about this is it's possible that Corinth never would have talked to Paul again after he says what he just got through saying. Because they may have come to the conclusion, you know what, I like these other guys who were called super apostles. I like them better than Paul. I mean, they had, they had the choice. Paul did not have control over what they would do. So in chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, he gives them a final warning, and he follows it up in verse 10 by saying, you know, I'm writing all this knowing that when I come to you, I'm going to have to come down either severely on you, or we're all going to be hugging because you got back on the right team, <laughs> is what he's sort of saying. The question is whether or not they really still have faith in Christ. And how are they going to find out whether or not they have faith in Christ? Now, what you believe... This, this is real important. I want you to understand that where you come from is not necessarily where you need to be. And where you're going is not necessarily where you need to be. Does that make sense? I'm not saying that everything that you learn is going to put you in a better place. 
But at the same time, when you hear new concepts, you don't need to do a kickback and say, you know what, my grandmama told me that's right. Well, maybe it's right, maybe it's not. But what you really need to do is an assessment and try to figure out what's right. And Paul says, verse 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test. And what's interesting about this is who administers the test? Paul does. <laughs> when he gets there, they're going to take a test. <laughs> and he's going to find out. I mean, they're not going to sit down with pencils and papers or papyri and, you know, <laughs> and check. Yes, you know. <laughs> Do you believe that Jesus really died on the cross? Yes or no? You know, and that's not what's going to happen, you know, okay? But it was going to be a test, a real-life test. The beauty of this is, we, uh, the beauty of this verse is so many times that we get to go back to my favorite uh, uh, parts of speech in the New Testament. Yes, I have favorite parts of speech. It's the personal pronouns. Uh, your. We usually read this your as singular. Let me give you a hint. Paul writes letters to churches, plural. So testing yourselves does not mean you going into your dorm room and sitting down and doing a personal evaluation. Testing is, is typically a community activity. Community of Christians is what he's talking about right here. They are, and, and here's part of the problem, is they're not testing, testing themselves. And one of the reasons they're not testing themselves is they don't have a reference point. Did you know that you as a group can shift endlessly in any different direction if you don't have a reference point? You must be a group that has in the midst of it Christ. You see what I'm saying? And whenever Christ does not become the one thing that unifies your group, then you don't know where you will go. And you won't see it happen either. Because change happens so slowly that you're not able to perceive it happening. You can only see it if you start looking at photographs. And, the, and what was the photograph for the Corinthian church? When Paul showed up, that was the photograph. Paul says, I brought you a message of Christ, and let's see if what I brought you looks like what you have now. And see, that was going to be that point when they do a comparison. But there has to be a group activity involved. That means you're going to have to be in conversation with other people. I would encourage you to make an effort to establish relationships in your, in your life that re reflect your life from as far back as you can go in time to now. It's healthy. Now, you might be saying, you know what? Uh, those people were not good to me. Well, you can still form some kind of relationship where you protect yourself. But you need to know where you've come from. You need to know where you've been. You need to know where you're going. Okay? And I think this is a concept that's important to Scripture as well. So it's this testing that, that needs to take place. You know, how, how are you going to test? Well, I, you know the word canon. We usually refer to it in reference to uh, what? The, the, the Old and New Testament, the 66 books. Where does the word canon actually show up in Scripture? It, it does. Galatians? Galatians? Re Revelation. No, not Revelation. Uh, or Revelations. I, I can't. That was a joke. <laughs> okay. Galatians 6. Galatians 6. Galatians 6, verse 16. Uh, 15 and 16. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them. The word rule. That's the word canon. What was the rule? You are a new creation. There's no such thing as circumcision as uncircumcision. That's the rule. That's the standard we're all going to go by. And if you remember that, we'll be in good shape. It also shows up in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I don't really have time to, to, to hash out all of these ideas. But it's really important that you take notice that the word canon shows up in chapters 10 to 13 of 2 Corinthians in the same discussion. Because Paul essentially begins the whole discussion in chapter 10 by talking about standards. Okay, if we're going to have a discussion about who's really an apostle and who's not an apostle, and who's really in Christ and who's not in Christ, we have to have some standards for this discussion. You see what I'm saying? And, and you know, it's the same thing in the Olympics. You've got to have standards. You know, one of the, 
Have you all heard about the guy who for, from South Africa? I think it's in this Olympics. When's the next one come around? Is it this year? This summer. This summer, that's what I thought. There's, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not a guy from South Africa can run the Olympics or not because of standards. And this is a real touchy issue. Do you want to know what's under discussion here? It's not the medications he takes or the probiotics or whatever it may be. It's his, it's his legs. What is unique about his legs? He doesn't have any. He has no legs. His, his legs end right here. I guess you could say he has three quarters of legs. But both of them end right here, and then from here down are these little uh, mechanical devices he slips on to nubs, and he gets out there and he runs at Olympic level speeds. The debate is whether or not he has the upper hand because of his feet, his fake feet and thighs. Isn't that fascinating? And it's real touching, touchy because this is a phenomenal thing. <laughs> you know, you're like, I don't care what he's sticking on his feet. He's running like that. You know, and so, but the, the issue is what are the standards? What are the actual rules? I mean, can somebody like this compete? Uh, this came up years ago, you know, when Carl Lewis uh, lost Ben Johnson from Canada because he was taking steroids. Ben Johnson won not because of, that, that's the question, did he really win as a human being or did, did he win as a stimulated human being? You know, because if you compromise the standards, the next question is, is can I do the, what is it, the 100 meter dash? Is that what they're doing? <laughs> Sprinters, can I do the 100 meter dash with a jet set on my back? You see what I'm saying? Is that okay with the standards? And so the question in Christianity is here with, is what are the standards? What, me, what makes you a Christian? What is the standard? Well, Paul's going to say, is Christ in you? Is Christ working in you? And then there's a lot of ways he's going, going to assess that looking at Scripture. But at very face value, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you say no, we have issue here, because we don't even have the same standards to talk about. You say, well, what in the world does this have to do with anything? There are, there are a lot, uh, well, it has a lot to do with a lot of things, and, but I'll just try to give you one or two applications. The standards for examining yourself are established on Christ, and you ought to start doing personal inventory with other people community, have mentors that you talk to. Here's the practical. You need to know where you're going, what's happening in your life. You're going to be stretched and challenged uh, through the school. I'm stretched and challenged through being here. And uh, you need to sort of monitor that. You know, it, 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 it blew me away uh, a few months ago when it occurred to me that when I started exercising that I had lost 50 pounds. 52 pounds. Why? Because I, could, I didn't actually see any change. I mean, none, none of it was perceptible to me. The only thing that told me that there was change were scales. Do you see what I'm saying? So you've got to have some standards put in place. I mean, you're going to show up at some congregation and be on the planet Mars, and you're not going to know it. You're going to have little green ears growing out of your head, and you're going to stand up there, and you're going to say stuff, and they're going to go, where did this kid come from? What, what in the world is this guy talking about? Because you need to know where you're going and where you've come from. You know, on the other hand, you, they, the first time you stood up from them, they may have gone, this kid has green ears, he's from Mars. And now you come back and they may go, what has happened to him? He's something else. You see what I'm saying? But how do you know that's happening? How do you know that change is occurring? I'm always fascinated by politicians, especially this time of year. I get fascinated about how completely out of touch they can be sometimes. I love it when they make bets of $10,000 on stages in front of thousands of people and millions of people hear it. And I'm like, you just made a bet of $10,000? You've got to be kidding me. And you didn't know that was out of touch with the average American? You know, that just blows my mind. Uh, it just blows my mind when we, and I'm really not trying to tell you who I'm you know, siding with any of this kind of stuff. But it blows my mind that um, when we have politicians who, uh, who think that uh, one of the guys says he has character, and, but at the same time he wants open marriages with his wives, you know, does, does this not, does nothing stick out as, you know, it, what, you know, what I'm thinking to myself is, is, does it not occur to you 
that uh, if, if you don't have integrity on this issue, why in the world should I entrust with you an entire nation? Because what you say means nothing. You see what I'm saying? Trust. There's trust issues here. That's what I'm trying to say. They're out of touch. You know, I can only imagine that at a certain point in time, they weren't out of touch. When did they lose touch? How did they get from point A to point B? And they're, they're deeply wanting to convince us that they're just like they were at point A. And some of them succeed, and some of them don't. I'm also impressed with kids, watching kids grow. You know, my, my son is about this, this tall now, which just blows me away. You know, why, the appropriate response is supposed to be, you're kidding me, really? You know, <laughs> that you know make me feel good. But uh, he's, he's about this tall, but uh, I remember, you know, there's only a few moments that stick, sticks out, out, not a few, but there's these moments that happen outside of the routine that we as a society sort of point out as, you know, like supposed to be big moments. And one of them is uh, when we learn to ride bicycles. You know, I mean, nobody cares when we first eat Brussels sprouts. I mean, that would be great if we could, as a group, decide this is going to be a benchmark. But it's riding a bike. Um, and I remember one day, uh, Samuel had, had a buddy over to the house. And what was so funny was the buddy came over to the house, and two hours later when he went home, he was riding a bicycle. And so he shows up at home, and he's like, hey, Mom and Dad, I can ride a bike. And and uh, the parents were like, thank you all so much for teaching my child to ride a bicycle. You know, so I could feel these like massive waves of sorrow, you know, coming through them as they're saying this. And I was like, well, I wasn't really trying to teach him how to ride my bike. My son was riding it, and he wanted to ride one too. And so we just got on the bike and started riding it. And uh, it was this growth. But what amazes me is how kids don't even notice it. They don't pick up on it at all. I mean, they weren't riding a bike yesterday, and the next day they're riding the bike, and they don't care. You, you see what I'm saying? We're, we're just not reflective, as reflective as we ought to be about our lives. So, long story short, what I'm trying to tell you is a few things. One, you need to monitor yourself. Number two, church leaders in church leadership, how are you monitoring the movements of your church? I mean, how, do, how do churches know where they're going and where they've been? Do they keep up with that? My experience is, is that many churches don't keep up with it. I see these massive ships out in the sea, and they don't have sails, and they don't have rudders. They have maybe like a few oars. And in, in, in ministry, you need to think about what the church stands on. And what's amazing is most people define these things based on cultural standards about what you think about contemporary issues it means nothing. You know, uh, I, I get this all the time. People are always trying to pigeonhole what we're like. You know, and so, somebody said, said to me in class a few weeks ago, he said, hey, there's somebody in my church who, who's uh, he's trying to get the congregation to raise their hands in worship. What do I do about it? And I said to him, well, I said, if he's going to get the congregation to raise their hands in worship, then he needs to make sure to do other things too. Make sure that you have a, uh, a few members who will make sure you're all doing holy kisses on Sunday. Make sure you're washing people's feet on Sunday. You've got to do that. And make sure the women have their heads covered when you come to worship. And if he will <clears throat> raise his hands and get everybody else to do it, make sure to do the, all the other things too. And the reason I said that, I was, I was sort of joking with him because it's not like anybody's... I don't know why, but washing feet just hadn't hit the, you know, the major move. We need somebody like... What's it? Francis Chan does like start pushing feet washing or something, and and then when that happens, it's going to be the most liberal cutting edge thing, you know. But uh, well, see, the reason I say this is because you know I don't care if if they're doing that or not. These are uh, they're all misreadings of scripture when you do it that way. Why? What's the standard? The standard in in my case is scripture. It's a holistic concept of what the Bible is, who Jesus Christ is. And, the, and, and, you, and, it's, and it's real hard to figure out, based on these come-and-go issues, what, what somebody's like. But you need to start examining yourself, your congregations, and the people you associate with, and just sort of try to get your bearing. And, and write down a basic list of, of standards you're talking about. How do, they, how do they line up when it comes to Scripture? How do they line up when it comes to morality as laid out in Scripture? How do they line up 
in comparison to Christ and his life and his teachings, how they line up to what Paul shared with us in the early church about how the church should be, how they should think, and just set these standards out and just start talking to people about it. It'll be a blast. Uh, talk to other people, talk about yourself in a relationship to these things, and learn to experience and enjoy what's involved under, if you want to put it all under a canopy, it's in spiritual transformation. Becoming more like the image of God. Becoming more a servant of God. And doing it together. And sort of watching where you're going. Keep journals. There's all different kinds of ways you can do this. Photograph your congregations. I mean, that's what the little boards on the front are, are aren't they? Where we have numbers up there. That's some form of assessment. Well, I'm not quite sure if we know what we're doing with the numbers, but we have some form of assessment. Just get in the process of doing that with yourself spiritually, and I think that it'll bless you tremendously. I want to say more, but I'm not. Thanks very much.